so many practitioners that are healing healers or intuitives are recognizing that it's just at a time like kids are coming in with a different level of connection sensitivity. It, it's just heightened right now. It really is. And um, many of these kids, they take on and can feel other people's emotions as if it's their own. And sometimes they can't tell the difference between what's their emotions and what they're picking up from someone else. Ellen Edmondson, a published author, medium, and intuition coach, is sharing her expertise on supporting highly intuitive children. She delves into recognizing and embracing the unique abilities of these gifted kids and offers practical advice on how to best support them. As Ellen puts it, don't let our children become recovering intuitives. Karma Hub, exploring healing, wellness, and the practitioners that offer it. I had this period of time where I went through, I call my spiritual awakening, where within a period of nine days, I went from automatic writing to automatic typing to being able to really sense and, you know, deceased, you know, energies around me, invisible energies around me. Um, I even started speaking in trance. I didn't even know what that was. All this happened in nine days. My husband said, you know what? We need to figure this out. Because I was like, I don't know if I'm going cuckoo berries. I don't know what all this is. He mm -hmm. said, let's see if we can figure it out. He said, you know what? Um, I'll, I'll do some research. And he found an intuitive development class. Mm. And see, he his when he he knew more about metaphysical than I did because I grew up mostly building. He was Catholic too, but he his family, his mother was into energy healing to some okay. degree. And so they were he was a little more familiar with this. So we found an intuitive development class. And when we went to it, and I talked to the uh, minister, the reverend there, and she explained everything. And she's like, Oh no, sweet. She said, You're not going cuckoo berries. She said, You just have a gift. You're gifted in a different way. And she said, you're meant to use that gift to help share it with the world. And so she was the first one to tell me, she's like, you need to take, because that's the beginning of the writings. And I just published a book that came out last November, which is a compilation of 10 years of writings that I had done from this point of when it started. So I understand your 14-year-old uh, son is a published writer. Well, he has <laughs> writings in the book. He has writings in the book. <laughs> He does. But you, and so I, I think that's pretty that. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, this is where it's interesting. I'll fast forward, but I'll go back a little bit. And I spent a lot of time on this and we'll fast forward. But yeah. one night I was putting him to bed and uh, it was a fire truck went by and he was almost panicked. And so I'm like, okay, so what's, what's going on? Tell me what's happening. And he's, as he calmed down, he could finally start to talk. Now he's, he's like 18 months, two years old at this time. He didn't watch TV because we didn't let him watch TV up to that point. So we knew he couldn't have gotten this from anywhere else. But he started explaining to us. He said, Mom, these bad men were chasing me. And he said, when I was grown, these bad men were chasing me. And they chased me. And I ran into a building that was on fire. And he said, and my body died, but I didn't. Mm -hmm. I went to the nowhere place. And he said, but you and dad were there and you were sad, but you weren't you and dad, you were other people. And he said, but I went to the nowhere place and I waited for you. And he said, and I waited and waited. And he said, and you you two took a long time to come back together, which he was talking about now because we got married, we we're older. And he said, you took a long time to get together. I was waiting for you. He said, but I came back to be your son. And in that moment, we were like, He's, and we had just started reading more about all of this because with what was happening with me about past lives. And I was like, he's talking about, we said, he's talking about a past life when he was grown. He's only 18 months old, two years old. So we started talking about past lives and just fast forward, he started. How common is that for kids to talk about past lives? That's actually, it's probably more common than what people realize. Okay. And because people children, just dismiss it, I assume most of the time. People do dismiss it. They will dismiss it. Um, they think kids are making it up, or there's just an imagination, or you know, they're they're not sure where it's coming. They're just like, don't talk like that. That kind of it does get dismissed. But children up to the age from zero up until about seven years old, they're very intuitively connected. I would say right brain connected, okay. and that's because logic and learning hasn't kicked in. They haven't gone into that logical linear thought process that happens when they get into school. And when they start learning the ABCs and the one, two, threes, that's when our linear brain kicks in and that logical thinking 
which then kind of crowds out that intuitive, creative, imagination, you know, imaginary play, connecting into that sense of self, which is that intuitive self. And so kids up to that point are connected to it. So it's not uncommon. And parents may, they may remember or they're going through it right now. If they have young children where they may be talking about certain experiences, some imaginary friends, some may say they're talking to angels or some are talking to, you know, people that aren't there because they're just naturally connected to the sixth sense realm at, at that young stage. Gotcha. So he, um, but he started, he, he talked about in past lives and there are references. We have a website and there's a, a, even books on children who've discussed and talked about past life experiences. And I always refer parents to that to help them understand that this is more common than what people may think. Yeah, do you have a sense of like a, a percentage like broadly, I mean, I, I feel like I hear stories like this fairly often, and I, I know this is kind of a focus of yours. Do you have kind of a, a sense of how common it is and it's just overlooked? Um, not an exact percentage, but I know that this has been, it's actually been researched and there's, uh, like I mentioned, books out there on this. Um, we we have a website up on our Highly Intuitive Kids website with books and resources that have th books and research on the whole topic of, of past life memories um, for for young children. And it's all over the world. And I love these stories. There's especially one with Wayne Dyer, and I can't remember the woman right off the top of my head who wrote it, but it's called Memories from Heaven. And that's a, it's a good one for parents to read, just to, to become aware of it. But it's like I mentioned, kids are at that young stage are just naturally tapped into into the bigness of their soul i'll just put it that way that the, yeah, their like internalness that. of who they are and so when they come in and, and a lot of times children so some of the other things that they may express like knowing a past life might be one what are some of the other things they may be able to kind of tune into um for kids who are intuitively connected they tend to see understand and know things beyond their years um because if you I know many people have probably heard somebody say, oh, they're a wise old soul. They seem like they've been here before. You know, they know things. Like even just using the example of our son, he would come to us and talk about things that like he knew that we hadn't said to him when he was very young. Um, my husband and I had um, fertility issues. We were told we weren't going to be able to have children and we ended up having our son. But before we had our son, um, they were telling us adoption was the only option. But we did actually end up getting uh pregnant but we didn't that pregnancy i miscarried so when ethan was maybe about i don't know four he came and he started talking to us and we had never mentioned this to him and he started talking about a brother he's like i have a brother he said this brother but what did you do with them did you give him away i was like we didn't give away brother he's like i have he started mentioning about this brother that was coming to visit and then we, he, my husband and I realized it's like he's sensing, he's picking up on his sibling that wasn't born. So, but it pushed us into having a conversation. One, we didn't, we didn't think to bring it up just because that was before him, but we were thinking he was too young to even have that kind of a conversation. But he knew, he, he sensed it. He was getting visits from his sibling on the other side. That's and so, and we've heard this kind of a story from other parents of kids knowing things like this or picking up on sensing that, um, you know, being able to have experiences where they can predict things, um, where they're also seeing, you know, deceased relatives around. And I always mention to parents when they're, you know, come to us with these types of concerns about, oh, they're saying they see this person, they're seeing energies or they're kind of scared. I tell folks to keep out, uh, because a lot of times for young children, they are sensing departed loved ones, deceased loved ones around them. Um, our son stopped being able to sleep in his bed at three when my father-in-law passed away. And he started telling us, you know, grandpa's in the room with me. Wow. And so he sensed that his grandfather was there. Um, and that's when he stopped being able to sleep at night. And But it came and went. Like sometimes he would see, he could see him. Sometimes he just sensed that somebody was there. I always tell folks, keep out family albums which is a great thing for children who are sensitive because a lot of times they may 
point to or identify that whoever they're seeing, if they're clairvoyant, if they have the ability to, to see psychically, um, or if they're just sensing, they'll know. They may be able to pick out in a family album who it is oh. and be able to share that. But what I offer to parents is you have to be open to that and don't dismiss your child's experiences when they are saying they are seeing or sensing. Because sometimes if they shut down early on, it goes back to your original statement, Lauren, you're creating adults who have to recover and reconnect back to themselves because they get shut off or shut down if the adults around them don't understand it and don't help them embrace it. You know, it gets dismissed. So then the child loses that sense of understanding or trust that what's happening to them is is a real experience. Just not that everybody has that same type of experience, although this is a little more common than what people think. It's interesting that kids are so much more in tune than us as adults. Um, you know, why is it that kids that have these gifts, these sensitivities, why is it that they have um, uh, challenges in school? Well, take it from two different angles. But the, these children who are highly intuitive and sensitive in this way, they tend they tend to have some challenges because they are when they're big thinkers they have deep thoughts and they can make connections intuitive leaps in thought that the school systems don't uh, aren't set up for mm -hmm. so it's like what i mentioned like when kids go to school they learn very linear that's how it's taught in the school that's how the schools that's the basis of them a b c one two three reasoning and linear thinking. But children who have this kind of a, an, a talent, an ability, they can make big leaps in their thought. So I always say, and my son is that way, and I've talked to many people whose children are highly intuitive that are this way, they go A, B, C, X, Y, Z. Because they can often pull in the, the details or get to the conclusion quicker, a lot of times daydreaming sets in, not paying attention in class, Sometimes teachers will say the lack of details in their work because they can get to the end conclusion that or math, they can tell you the number is 10. They might not be able, the answer is 10. They may not be able to tell you all the steps, write all the steps out, but they've got the right answer. So these children tend to, for that reason, and being advanced, they are in a situation where they have to, where they lose focus because other, you know, they're waiting for everyone else to catch up to their their way of thinking. So, what are some of the steps you? I guess do you work with the teachers or suggest to the teacher teachers or put together certain programs that might allow someone like this to better uh, in, embrace education? Sure, it, it, and I'll come back to that just in a quick second because I also want to say too because in, besides being able to take these big leaps in thought. Because they're sensitive to energies around them, there's quite a, you know, at times that the children being in the cl large classroom sizes is another thing that can be an issue for these children. And like for us, we recognized early on, because our son is very sensitive to energies, that he needed immediately, he needed to be in smaller class sizes. So for us, and this is where parents have to look at the options they have available, because not everybody can do private schools or, you know, you can look at charter schools. Private schools have smaller class sizes, um, learning environments like um, the Waldorf schools and certain Montessori schools that have a little more curriculums where there's a little more self-directed learning for the children gotcha. is really helpful. So those are some options that parents can look at. For us, we've had our son in private school. Every We tried one year for public school and we just knew that was not going to be the best thing for him. Smaller class sizes, less energy around him. Um, was better for him because, and even in that, we, what we've had to do is we've sat down and we've started talking with his teachers, especially after, well, Becca, we were on the Psychic Kids show and it was a Psychic Kids show. Yeah, yeah that was a, that was a big basis of how we, how Your I son was up. on a TV show on, <laughs> on a and E TV show, right? Yes. Yes. And and they gave him tests to verify that he truly was gifted in these ways. Yes. Because see, when he all he started opening up and going through what he was going through, and I was too, we had never seen this in a child. We were dealing with me, and I'm, you know, an adult, 
trying to work through this. I'm what you would call recovering, trying to connect back to who I was. Fair enough, yeah. yeah. And he's opening at the same time. And we didn't know exactly how gifted, how sensitive. We, we didn't know the context of Paula. So I was like, you know, praying for answers to how do we help him? Because I knew we couldn't go to a doctor and talk about this. And I knew there wasn't anything, quote unquote, like wrong with him. Everything was right with him. He just had what I had. I knew he had what I had, but I don't know what, how do you handle this for a kid? So we couldn't go talk to a doctor. We didn't go talk to school. It's like, who do you talk to? Right. So as we were trying to figure out how do we really help him because he's sensitive, I got an email that just happened to come across my inbox that Illuminate Festival Judy had sent out. Yes. And she said she normally didn't send things out like that, but she had just happened to send it out. And I was just praying for it. I need an answer to how we can help him. And it was a casting call for um, psychic kids. And so in that moment when I saw it, I was like, this might be an answer. So I just shot out a message and it was like two hours later, they responded right back and we did a back and forth and we had to do interviews and they really vet the kids for this. So if anybody, those shows, they you actually have to go through interviews and talking with psychologists and everything. They don't let, it's not just kids just get on the show and families, they vet you thoroughly. How so, old was he at that time? He was eight at the time. He was eight. Um, and so I tell you, you, you mentioned something, you mentioned uh, the Illuminate Festival briefly. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that that's where I crossed paths with you originally, right? And your story or your son's story, or your family's story resonated with me so much because, you know, my son's also very intuitive and um, yeah, he's definitely beyond his years. He wants to be a therapist. I personally think he's going to be a fantastic therapist. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, he sees uh, things, he knows things, he, uh, um, you know, all that stuff. And so when you told your story, I was like, well, I've got one of those, <laughs> one of those gifted kids. Um, and so, you know, I definitely wanted to speak with you more about it and get some more details because it is fairly, it's close to my heart. Um, and so... You do lectures, I guess, Illuminate Festival being one. I know there's a couple of festivals in the area um, that allow for things like that. How are, what are some of these other ways that you're able to get this voice, this important message out to people? Well, and I, I really love the fact that I went to Judy, um, the Illuminate Festival, under the Illuminate Festival, Festival, and talked to her about this effort and trying to, you know, getting off the ground with wanting to get the word out into the community and explained it to her and asked her if she'd be a sponsor. And she's like, oh, I would love that. I'd love to sponsor, you know, to help get this out because she met so many people and continues to meet as we hold these festivals, so many people and parents and kids, so many practitioners that are healing healers or intuitives are recognizing that it's just at a time like kids are coming in with a different, level of connection sensitivity oh, yes. um, that it, it's just heightened right now. It really is. And um, many of these kids um, who are truly intuitive, highly intuitive, they get labeled as ADD or ADHD, mm -hmm. um, some sensory processing disorder, because this high intuition can mimic those things. And part of why we set up our highlyintuitivekids.com website was for parents to look and get information about this because when they these children like we were mentioning about the school environment if it's they're not in the right environment they can lose focus easily because it, it's not so much out of not the ability to pay attention it's out of boredom not being connected with the work right. it's it's that kind of a thing and so um with that, Judy, when I told her all about, you know, all of this and wanting to get the word out, she said, you know, yes, I'll sponsor and pair up with you. So that was what started me being able to do workshops locally and going out and talking to local communities. And as I stepped into what you said, you know, stop hiding. <laughs> I was like, yeah, so I'd like to, I'd like to mention that statement again. I'm going to circle back around. So your son came up to you and said, mom, stop hiding like dive, dive. Can you tell that story a little bit? Sure, sure. Because this was after we had been on the Psychic Kids show and they helped us to understand his level of sensitivity and, you know, 
His episode, just if anybody's interested, was called Ghost in the Bed. We were in the premiere episode when it aired in August of 2019. But that was a catalyst of us understanding. And for him, that made a big change for him because he realized there were 15 other kids featured on that show across the country. Mm-hmm. And we watched all the episodes when it aired. And he, the one thing we saw in him is he didn't feel alone. He didn't feel like, right. I'm strange. He's like, and that's what we talked about. And they had a he got to understand that this was not, this was a, a gift and not a burden. And that's what we needed him to understand. But it was after that show, see, I had been doing, read, started, I've been doing readings for people and we knew we would talk about this at home, but it was like, you know, keeping it quiet, not really out there, like pushing it out there publicly or anything. But one day he comes home because he had gotten bullied bad in, in elementary school when he went to the public school because he would talk about things that kids didn't understand that were related to his abilities. Um, so one day he came home, he's a little down. I was like, Ethan, you have to, I was like, you know, you have this gift. You have to be confident in yourself. You can't worry about what other kids are saying. I'm giving the whole spiel you, a parent will give a child to try right. and help feel better. And he looked at me and he said, mom, I can't be me until you be you. Yes. Stop hiding. That's so amazing. Yes. And he's, he's, this is my eight-year-old. I'm sitting here. I was like, wow, <laughs> I just, I just stopped for a minute and I was like, it was just like the universe came and just kind of gave me a little wake up slap. And it's like, you know, and I said in that moment to myself, it just clicked. It was like, I mean, the universe is always like, he's absolutely right. I was like, how can I sit here and tell him to be confident in yourself and don't worry about anybody else's saying, and you need to be you. And, and I'm not doing the same thing. Right. Yeah. So I uh, tell my son often, well, like, do as I say, not as I do. But I really should also do, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> they're watching and they're modeling. You know, we're the model for them. And so it was at that point <laughs> that right. I'd say that was the key point that just changed everything for me. And I said, you know what? We're going to take this and help other people. And I'm going to be out there publicly with my gifts. And and because this is a gift of helping folks, of being of service is how we look at it and what we're teaching our son. And so that's what we did. And that, that's what changed. That's the catalyst for all of this. Fantastic. Yeah. So my fa- my son has um, attention uh, AD, ADHD. And, <clears throat> and so, we, you know, we struggle with that a, a little bit. And, you know, his earlier days when I pick him up from school, he'd be all just completely scatterbrained. And I'd kind of sit him down. And sometimes I'd give him Reiki. Uh, other times we'd do breath work. And then it would really kind of, recenter himself and then from we could go do the rest of the day extracurricular activities karate or whatever sport it was um but he doesn't have that at school he doesn't have that moment of collect your energies or make sure that you're safeguarded he doesn't have that reminder so he just you know he had challenges and you know he um on and off was put on on medicine which I'm not a huge fan of, um, but definitely found that just by doing some simple exercises, he could then kind of restructure, reorient himself, and then move forward in a more positive manner. Um, yeah, so that was that was interesting. Then you were talking about uh, ADD and ADHD because mm-hmm. I feel like that's just kind of uh, a sweeping label that's given on given to so many kids these days. Um, I heard in one of your other interviews mentioning when they diagnose like ADHD or ADD, um, it's really kind of a matter of is does it come from uh, is it brainstem? Is that correct? Is it a brainstem issue or is it a energetic issue? Can you talk right. a bit on that? That's what I I. I want people to educate themselves, parents to educate themselves about. And I keep referring back to the hollyintuitivekids.com website because just to tell you how that started, even for that whole effort, um, after this conversation with Ethan and knowing that I was going to start putting myself out there with all of this in a bigger way, it was like for about three weeks, I was woke up at 3 a.m. in the morning getting downloads of setting up a website and starting a parent group, and this is how you do it and what you need to put on it. So I was getting 
and people get this the thing because i had made that decision this was going to be my work i was listening and really i would wake up and just start writing down what i was feeling was coming to me and the, the guideline and within like you know a few months i had propped everything up and was getting i'd say probably six months i had started standing things up but part of it the information that's on this site is tied to certain studies doc phd studies and we i wanted this to be very credible for parents to understand. So when they go out and look at this information, there's links to other um, to research and, and doctor's information studies to look at this. But for this, because it mimics having high intuition, which is really more like what you're saying, it's really more of a grounding. So like your breath, uh, breath work, meditation, exercise to release the energy, um, you know, visualization, those are all things that help children to manage their energy, learning how to do grounding and boundary setting with their energies. Um, that's important. And so parents want to be able to, when they're talking to their doctors, to find out, is it a brainstem issue? Well, actually, that's going to be related to the diagnosis, whether it's ADD, ADHD. Just being clear with your diet, is it a brainstem issue? And if it's not really a brainstem issue, it may be an environmental issue. Mm. And that's the environment and how we work with our children to ground themselves and to be able to um, center themselves more. And that's really important because uh, for, for, for our son, we recognize, especially because we knew the abilities I had, since he's been six, he's been track. That's one of the ways that helps him to manage his energy and, and that extra overload that he gets just by going to school and being around groups of other children when you were saying your son's going to be a, a great therapist, I know he probably will be because these children are, they have such a great capacity for empathy and understanding other people. And they can even take on true empaths and in, in, with this connection with um, high intuition, they take on and can feel other people's emotions as if it's their own. And sometimes they can't tell the difference between what's their emotions and what they're picking up from someone else. So we need to teach our kids how to do body scanning before they even walk into a room or a classroom to know how are you feeling, check in with how you're feeling before you get in. If you're all, you're feeling fine and everything's great, that's you. You go into a room and you start feeling depressed and sad and you find out a friend in there, you know, has just had a bad day or you know, something has happened and they're depressed and so you're picking up. Are you picking up? like a cold, you're catching a mood cold from the other child. You know, you start teaching them how to, to recognize these kinds of signs for themselves and then how to put boundaries around their energy, visualization and surrounding themselves in white light and bubbling up their own energy so they're not affected by others. It's techniques that they need to, okay. to be taught. Yeah, so one of my questions here was, what are some of the best practices to help kids cope? And you're saying kind of scan the room, breath work. Can you kind of list those off a little bit? Sure. Um, some of the things that will help kids to I'd say self-regulation, self-management. And this is some of the things even, I'll just give you one example of a quick thing with our son. Um, our son has been in, he's been in private school. He's been in public school. He's just coming off of homeschooling. We even took in homeschooled him for two years. Um, and now he's back in school. Kids with disability, um, it can be up and down. You just, you have to tune into your child and what they need at that time, and then what you can do for them to help them to move, you know, move through it. So, I offer to parents: don't be afraid to make those kind of adjustments. But one time, when Ethan was in school, he had a teacher who actually happened to be, and I knew she was intuitive. She would start the class with two minutes of meditation before she went into the class. And I remember Ethan coming home and talking and saying, it was so great when this teacher would do this two minute meditation. He said, it helped ground me for the, and I could focus really clearly for the rest of the class or I felt more calm in the class when she would start that way. And I was like, just little things like that for teachers to be aware of that if they can pull those things in just that two minutes helps to recenter and refocus people, uh, the kids, not, not just kids, adults too, even adults who may come home extra drained and, you know, 
highly intuitive, sensitive people understanding how to work with their energies. But definitely breath work is something, learning how to do breathing techniques that help to calm the central nervous system. Because all of this um, intuitive information downloads through our nervous system, our central nervous system. And so when we help to keep it calm and regulated, we're helping also to deal with the flow of the intuitive information that's coming through us and that we're picking up from our environment and from the people around us. So breath work, yoga is another one because it's Tai Chi, those Qigongs, anything with energy work like that. Um, Just even for kids, just movement, because one of the best things for children is just is a lot of movement and that helps to burn off and release their, the intuitive information, energy that they've picked up. Even art, something as simple as artwork helps them process hmm. that energy because it, our intuitiveness comes through the right brain, which is the creative brain. And for children, just even being able to draw, paint, whatever their creative outlet is, letting them do that, that processes that intuitive energy out of them as well. Yeah. You know, do you work with different school systems, different teachers? Are there different programs that... Um can help to recognize these children and and, and put this put them on a, a path and that uh, supports them a little better. Well, and that's the beauty of like this effort that we're doing with highly intuitive kids. That's what we're trying to get out there into the schools and all. And one of the beautiful things is as we've been out talking in the communities mm-hmm. through the what we mentioned the Illuminate Festival, I've been in touch and talking with teachers. I've had teachers, I've had therapists, counselors, people come up and they'll start talking and say, saying, because folks are recognizing this. I'm, you know, working with children this way. I'm supporting children this way. I'm teaching children. So we've had people coming up and talking with us who are in those different professions. We've had people comment on the website because there's information out there that teachers have been able to to glean from counselors have looked at the site and it's like, oh, this is so helpful. And this is where in we have a, a Facebook community, it's parent community, but anybody, pretty much anybody who's interested can join. We have teachers and therapists and counselors and folks who are in there that get information from the group. Um, we've brought in guest speakers who talk about different topics, you know, just postings in the group, um, informational postings. So we're still growing and still pushing to get this more out into the schools, but definitely that's our you know continued goal. But we have been talking to pockets of people and in the group, we have monthly meetups, community meetups, and we've had teachers come in, they ask questions and how they can best support. So there's dialogue and, and, and talking. And the group is, the thing that I think is really wonderful is we have people from different countries in the group, Um, all over so this is there's no there's children everywhere i've always they're around the world have this ability it's not always understood but it's children everywhere yeah you know i i I think i really want to hone in on how parents act or react when their kids start opening up to some of these things and what are what's some good advice that you can offer parents when the kids express themselves in this way Oh, that, that's a good question. And that, that's a that's a big key question because one of the, the best things that parents can do is just, even if you don't share the gift, parents who share the gift will know how to, to work with them a little more. But even if you don't share the gift or don't understand it, the best thing a parent can do is just to be open to it, not be dismissive of it. Because children, once kids feel like they're not being heard, they're not being understood, that how who they are and how they are in the world showing up isn't being valued. They shut down. Mm-hmm. And then once they shut down those gifts, because it's like, oh, don't talk about it or don't say that, don't let people know about it. I'll give you an example. When Ethan, um, we were telling, when he would talk about his gifts in our house, we, we openly have always talked about things. But before we really knew exactly how sensitive he was, we knew how sensitive he was, but he was more he had more gifts and sensitivities than what we realized and we didn't he was going to school and talking about things like he would come home and say mom i was trying to explain to the other kids that we're multi-dimensional beings and they just were not he's like you know eight years old 
And so they didn't understand. They're just looking at him like, okay. Or, you know, I just, I was trying to tell them that a first language, we didn't talk with words. We talked with our minds. We used telepathy. And he would be saying these things. And I would tell him, I was like, Ethan, don't talk about that out when you're not, don't talk about that out to other people because they're not going to understand. Well, the more we were telling him, don't talk about it. And it was for his protection. He thought he was internalizing it. Something was wrong with him. And it was like, no, there's nothing wrong with you. It's that other people don't understand it. But kids are so sensitive. That's, and you have to be clear. They can take it on differently. But when with children, if they say, oh, I'm seeing something. I'd say, oh, great. You know, tell me more about it. Oh, why don't you draw it out? Let them fully express themselves, not shut them down. Because shutting them down is one of the worst things that that can happen. And then as they move through from whatever point, you know, young years to teen years to I've heard quite a few stories of people who have developed addiction issues to deal with the sensitivities that people around them did not understand and they didn't feel they could share and talk to others about it. And I have a, a, a story of a, a young man who he was 14 and I did a reading for his mother. He was a stepmother and his stepmother said, I don't know why I feel the need to tell you this, but she started explaining that her about her son and how he was, he was smart, but he, he was just starting to draw distance from, from them. And she was explaining all these things that was going on with him, like at school. And she goes, I just don't understand. But as she was talking, I kept getting pings and I was like, He's, he's doing and behaving and things like my son does. I said, your son, it doesn't sound like there's anything wrong. He's gifted. As I said, told her a couple of things. I said, ask him, does he see colors around people? Does he hear things or know things, experience? I gave her a list of things to go and talk to him about. And it was about just like two days later, she sent me a note. She comes back and she tells me, she said, oh my gosh, thank you so much. She said, because, well, even before that, she was telling me she thought her son, her stepson might commit suicide. After she went back and asked him those questions, and they were Baptist, um, so he didn't feel he could talk about all these experiences he was having. She said, I went back and talked to him about these things, and he opened up and said, yes, I've been seeing invisible things. I've been hearing things. I've been." She, he started explaining, and she goes, oh, my gosh, you just saved my son's life, because now we know. He's gifted and not something else wrong with him. And there are quite a few children who get experienced depression. Well, anxiety first. A lot of these kids have anxiety because they take on the energy around them. And if they're not taught how to set boundaries and how to manage their energy, um, then they chronic anxiety turns into depression. And if you get chronic depression, you can get into you know the suicidal thoughts. And unfortunately, high, highly intuitive children are more likely to follow through with suicide than other children because they feel things so deeply and they take it on so personally that they feel like there's really no way out. And so the best thing parents can do is just don't dismiss your child, listen to them, let them talk and express themselves and look for the signs. Like even on our website, we have the signs of high intuition, the signs of empathy, look at the signs of that they're showing and then connect into groups like this, like we have, and there's plenty of others. There's a lot of people doing work with children and, and all other practitioners connect into an intuitive, someone that you can talk to that can help you to, if you don't understand this yourself to at least be open to help your child. Oh, you mentioned Myers Briggs. Yes. A very wow. important tool and assessment to use. Yes. Why, that, why do you feel uh, there's that importance around it? Now, the Myers-Briggs, um, oh, and I'll, I'll go back to just like not dismissing your child and creating that safe space. Every child needs a safe space to be totally be themselves. And that that's the two things that parents can really give your child is to be open, to listen, and to create that safe space for them to be themselves. Now, for as far as the Myers-Briggs, that's in the, I, the Myers-Briggs is... Uh, a personality trait assessment. That's a fairly standard um, assessment that's given. Yes. And I believe that students, especially when you start in your teen kids, should take that because when you take the Myers-Briggs, it 
rates, it shows whether you're um, intuitive or whether you're sensing like the the uh, letters, the I-N, the intuitive, intuitive thinking and judging and then the sensing. It makes a distinction between people who lean toward being intuitive and those who are leaning toward more like the linear way of thinking and being. And so if you give kids the person their personality tests and test them, and I think this would be great for schools to do, is because then depending on how the kids come back and you get their personality traits, if you have a classroom of children that are more wired toward being intuitive, then setting the curriculum or the classroom in a way that supports that learning style versus just straight linear. Because the ones who are intuitive and who disengage because the environment isn't set up for them, sometimes they're the kids that are the disruptors in class. Sometimes they're the kids who are daydreaming. They're the kids that are you know, have a lot of energy that sometimes need to be burned off. And once they burn it off, they can then sit and focus. And so once you know what style a child has, then work to that style. And I, I think that would make a big difference. That makes sense. I mean, so there there are plenty of kids, uh, I'm presuming I'm going to make a, a general statement here, a sweeping statement. Um, so some kids learn linearly, like you're talking about. Some people are, are very uh, intuitive or gifted, but also maybe another category uh, for some kids are, is just... Um, um, artistic. They, they're they more creative. They don't think in this linear way. And um, I'm definitely very creative. And I had challenges in school because I don't abide by one, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, you know, I'm kind of like a big picture sort of guy. And that, um, um, but so even coming from that what that perspective which is um maybe a lot more palatable from most people's um point of view you know you're not talking about intuitive kids versus linear learning kids you're talking about artistic versus linear i agree i think the myers briggs assessment is a really important way to go and th there should be two different types of um styles that that schools offer to teach in well, and to your point, Lauren, I'll, I'll go back when I'm saying intuitive in that way. You're right, because there's different types of intuitives. There's there's the artistic, the creative intuitives. You have the kinesthetic, which is kids that are gifted with movement. So you may have a child that maybe is not, you know, doesn't, isn't tied to that linear way of thinking. But you look at the phenomenal athletes at a young age. Look at the child prodigies, whether it's in art, whether it's in science, but it's these children think differently. They make different leaps in thought and how they move and what they do. So intuition, high intuition can inform any of those areas. Spiritually gifted kids that think beyond their years in, in like the big picture of things. An example I always give is Albert Einstein. He was one that he would have been considered a highly intuitive, if you want to, you know, person. Thomas Edison, another one, did not do well in school. He went on to invent the light bulb. They thought differently. Right. And so, and I used to, actually, I used to read the stories, their stories to Ethan all the time when he was younger, because I was like, it's okay to think differently. Right. It doesn't mean, it just means you think differently. You maybe learn in a different way, but you're super gifted. And every child is, I think every child is gifted in their way. But yes, but there are different types of intuitives. Um, so I, I look at it that, yes. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, that's, that's a very Myers-Briggs assessment. Okay. Well, I'll keep that in mind. I'll pass that along. That's a good tip. And I think it helps parents to know how to work with your child. Let yourself learn. That's, we put that up on the site. It really goes back to parents educating themselves and knowing these tools and these different things they can use to understand it helps them understand them, themselves better and helps to understand their child better. Um, when you under, know that, like if your child just is not a linear thinker, is more of a creative or is more kinesthetic, like movement is really what gets them, then set them up with those. Well, you, you'll see these uh, Myers-Briggs Myers assessments even on dating sites. Mm -hmm. So 
if dating sites benefit, certainly schools would benefit by having them. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, that's one of the things I think is a, is a conversation. I, I hope that schools will start considering that, at least for high schools. I think middle schools and high schools. It, it's so, I think it would be eye-opening for the kids, not to use it to label further, but to understand not to have, oh, these, these are the intuitive kids here. and these are Because it's not one is better than the other. It's just how you process things mm-hmm. and all of it complements each other because you need some of both. You need all of it right. to, you know, in any organization or any effort. You need, you need the, the ones who can execute the details like the ones who can come up with the vision. You can't have the vision without the details and you can't have the details without it being tied to a vision. So you need everyone working together and our intuitive kids are just a little bit more they're visionaries and they think in that big picture way in whatever area whether it's creative or whether it's science or whether it's spiritual or you know the different forms of intuitives that are out there I wanted to circle back around to this book that you released not long ago at the end of last year uh, a place of love and light it's won um many awards uh which is very exciting it's available on amazon and i'll have those links up and I guess it's won its fourth literary award, which is that's fantastic. Your son wrote two short writings in the book as well. Um, so he's a published author, which is <laughs> age of 14th is, is pretty, pretty amazing. Um, what's the big takeaway from this book? Like what's the main goal um, of, of writing this, this book? And what are you hoping that people walk away with knowing? Well, this book, I say, is definitely, uh, it's a labor of love. And it was when I mentioned back when my abilities opened up and it started with um, writing and with the automatic writing and information just flowing to me that I just started writing down what I started receiving. Um, At first it was automatic writing and it moved from actually where I could feel my hand being taken over and writing that way to just receiving blocks of thought from my guides my divine invisible supporters who started sending me this information after they knew i could understand them with sending the thoughts to me versus actually taking hold of my hand i just would start getting all these profound wisdoms coming to me so i would write them down and i wrote them down and i started posting them on my website Mm. that was 10 years ago i would post them weekly i was just putting all this out there but then last year i just was really guided and just directed to pull all this together in a book and offer it on a larger scale because the wisdoms in there are just so beautiful and it's about it's it's just about how we need to show up in the world and live more compassionately we need to live authentically and how how we show up makes a difference and how we can positively contribute to the world so showing up and letting and being connected to that deeper part of yourself that helps you know your purpose and your why and what you're meant to do while you're here and so all of that um it was pulled together to offer that out um as a to help people on their personal and spiritual journeys that's really the aim of the book and i did there is a a small chapter it wasn't specifically about children but it can be a, it can apply to children. It's more like a devotional style book, a collection of short writings and poetry and prose. Okay. That I will tell parents read it with your children. Even you know it's not for young young kids, but as they progress, as your children are progressing, and remember most of these children are wise beyond their years. Even at eight years old, Ethan was asking sometimes, "What is my life purpose? Why am I here?" At that young age, and they'll. A lot of these kids think that way because they're advanced and they're here to do big things. So sometimes at that age, they're thinking in that way. And I remember back when I was eight years old, I was thinking that way. And I always said back, that was, and this is the first time I'm going to share this. When I was eight years old, I said, one day I'm going to write a book. And I used to always think it would be a love story because, you know, I was like, oh, you know, young girl love story. But after I wrote this book and it was out, I realized, I told my husband, I was like, you know what? I did write a love story. I wrote the love story of of like the universe to us and how we offer it back. It's about unconditional love and how we need to treat each other and show up in that capacity to understand that there's more commonalities among everybody than the differences that are there. 
Mm-hmm. Different when we focus on those differences, it divides us. But when we focus on the commonalities, that's what makes humanity stronger and moves us forward. And this book is really a combination, a collection of beautiful wisdoms that are there to help. Um, you know, like I said, help people with their personal spiritual growth, but definitely is something that can be read to children as well, older children. <laughs> and and all of these um, discussions that we're having, I feel like, well, something you had yeah. said, you really are putting in efforts to try and normalize these conversations to make it not so weird. So people might think with a little more open mind and take avenues they wouldn't um, otherwise take for their kids, for themselves. Um, and, you know, of course, I do this podcast called Karma Hub, and that's largely what that's about. It's just getting a little bit more information out there to in hopes to normalize these conversations. So people will be like, you know, it's not about necessarily what we see on TV or the ads that we experience. There's a lot more available, a whole lot of which we just don't understand. But if you're open up to that, uh, you can dive into it and wonderful things will happen. Absolutely. That is absolutely correct, Lauren. And that's why even for our efforts, when I talk about highly intuitive kids, and just to give, I don't say psychic, because a lot of people don't understand or they get put off by that word just because of how it's been portrayed as weird or scary or got a stigma they, to the there's to a title it's definitely it. a stigma to it. So we use words and languaging that will help the mainstream, like I was mentioning, like teachers, counselors, people can understand intuition and highly intuitive. It doesn't turn the population off um, because that is the goal. And I always, I, that's been a part of my mission of what's been coming through me is to help normalize it and help people to see it's just words. It's languaging, it's labels. Things mean the same. We just talk about it maybe in, from a different perspective in a different way. But once we can normalize it and get people to stop the stigmas of really see what it means, even for the, my book, it's a spiritual, it's a book on spirituality, but it's non-denominational. And it has quotes, for, it has scriptures in it, but it has quotes from all kinds of religious leaders and philosophers and big thinkers in the book. So it, it, really pulls together and helps people to see, to normalize that spirituality, the basis of everything is love. And it doesn't matter what religion or philosophy or background, love is love. And if you want to practice a faith of Catholicism or Judaism or Buddhism, no matter what it is, As long as it's leading us all back to understand our true essence, the authentic nature, the divinity that we have within, that is really, that everybody has it. We just get conditioned out of it by how we are in the world and the stigmas and the, the, you know, the, the labels and the things that get put on it. But whatever we're doing, if it's bringing us back to the place of love and light, it's not it's not the wrong thing. And we need to just look at that and how we're approaching it. So that is my, with the book is to normalize is non religion based is spirituality. And for this highly intuitive kids effort to normalize for people to understand this is just, we all have, everyone is intuitive. We all have it to different degrees. And some people are just more sensitive to than others, but it's really that connecting point where we are, connected to our soul and the eternalness of who we are. That's really what it it all comes back to. Beautiful. Um, Is there anything else that you wanted to uh, discuss before we start to wrap this up? Um, And I just encourage people to, if you have children, there's so much more than what we can cover, (laughs) you know, in this little time, but the website, hollyintuitivekids.com to check out that website that was put together with the intention to help educate people, the public, teachers, counselors. Um, If you find yourself as a parent, you don't know how to explain this or start the conversations. You always have a site. You have a credible site that you can go back to to share that information and start dialogues. Um, I'm also open and available for, I do coaching with 
families and just with parents, with individuals, um, but with families as well. Um, we put out information on, um, like I said, in within the group, we have experts come in. We have people to, want like-minded communities. We want people to know that they're not alone. And this is not so strange, unique. 15 to 20% of the population have this ability. <laughs> and so it's, yeah. It's there. It's there. It's not it. And the more people let themselves tune into it and let them be guided by that authentic, intuitive part of themselves, that's when we start. That's when we start. Um, we don't have to recover. <laughs> we stay in our power. And then that's when we really bring our true gifts and our true selves to the world in a better way. And if we focus in that way, we that goes back to we look at more of the commonalities and the differences and we start elevating, I would say elevating the consciousness of society to a different level for everyone. Thank you so much. This has been wonderful. Yeah. And thank you for what you're doing, Lauren, because that's, that's, this is your contribution of helping. And the more of us are helping people to understand this, it's going to start shifting things and, and making it better. And especially we got to get things better for the next generation. So they don't have to walk the harder path like the ones before them. 